In this series, we go over various fun facts and trivia about World of Warcraft that don't really fit into specific categories, with the hope that you'll find out something about the game that you probably didn't know before. Did you know that Flask and Vanilla WoW were incredibly overpowered? Most people know what a Flask is, as it's still one of the few consumables that is widely used in endgame content. You use one and then you get a buff of your choice that lasts for an hour, even through death, longer if you're an alchemist. And in Vanilla WoW, the process of obtaining a flask was just way more convoluted and difficult that they probably made it more powerful to compensate. Flasks required Black Lotus in order to make, which were on strict shared zone cooldowns, so there was a limited amount that you could even farm on a server per hour. You also could only craft a flask at an alchemist table, which could only be found inside Skolomance or Blackwing Lair which required you to run a raid or dungeon in order to even get to them. And even worse, before 1.7, if you spent all this time to get a flask and used it, and then died, it would go away. As flasks would not persist on death until patch 1.7 fixed this abysmal idea. So because the design philosophy behind flasks, whether they were enormously expensive buff that not everybody could use, the stats on them were definitely worth all the effort. The flask of supreme power from Vanilla WoW gave a plus 150 spell power bonus for two hours. To put how huge of a bonus this is into perspective, in the next expansion of the Burning Crusade, the flask which gave spell power only gave a plus 80, and only worked for specific schools of magic. If you wanted the flask that worked for all spell power, that was only a plus 70. And even in Wrath of the Lich King, the spell power flask only gave a plus 125. And Wrath was also when they reduced the base duration of flask to one hour, down from two hours. And since this was before there were stat squishes every other expansion, this did mean that a flask from Vanilla WoW was actually better than an endgame flask from Wrath of the Lich King, two expansions and power creep worth of gear later. Although this does not mean there were people using a vanilla flask in Wrath of the Lich King, because Blizzard nerfed the vanilla flask during Burning Crusades patch 2.1 to only provide a plus 70 spell power bonus. That way they wouldn't be better than the Burning Crusade flask. So, if the bonus of the flask from Vanilla WoW was actually higher than the flask from Wrath of the Lich King, that should tell you how powerful the original Vanilla Flask was, and why guilds were able to blow through content in Classic WoW when they were going into these raids and dungeons with full world buffs and full consumables like the old school flask. In Boralis, there's a group of cadets under a building playing a game of D&D. The four characters are standing around the table with one of them having a big screen in front of them, obviously making that person the Game Master, and they have quite a bit of unique dialogues, all of which are references to Dungeons and Dragons. Like the Game Master having to tell them that Bard isn't a class, as pretty much every other main class from Dungeons and Dragons is also in World of Warcraft, except for the Bard and Artificer classes. Bards, of course, being a spellcaster who uses music and talking as part of their weapon arsenal, as well as other normal magic and other normal melee abilities, while Artificer is basically just a tinker. Although, there are many other dialogues that just reference common D&D things. Like the quote, Stop antagonizing the quest giver, is a reference to D&D murder hobos, a term for players who constantly kill everything they come into contact with, including the game's versions of quest givers. Because in D&D, you can do basically whatever you want, and sometimes what players want to do is kill everything they come into contact with. But that usually involves antagonizing the quest giver first, so that they have a reason to kill them. It's generally a frowned upon term, but happens enough where it has its own term, the murder hobo. There is also a line, can the guard see me looting this body? Because in D&D, looting has a little bit more consequences than it does in WoW. As if you start looting the bodies of dead villagers in front of guards, there's a good chance they won't let you do that and might attack you or put you in jail. But players who are used to playing video games are generally stereotyped into wanting to loot everything they come across which is what this line is referencing. The line, I cast Frostbolt into the darkness, is a reference to the famous I attack the darkness D&D meme, popularized by machinima created by people who created the game Summoner, in which it depicts a sketch of four people playing D&D, with two of the people being new players and confused by the rules, with one of them stating that he wants to use one of his magical abilities to attack the darkness, which is a nonsense thing to attack. I, I'm attacking the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> There's also another reference in WoW, a quest that takes place in the Blood Mist Isle called I Shoot Magic Into the Darkness, where you run around and kill void creatures. And also, by the way, I actually have a D&D channel if you ever want to watch some D&D videos. Next up, let's go over a fun little fact about how stats are distributed. When it comes to a piece of equipment, 
Some of them have a lot more stats than the other ones, but it's kind of surprising just how much better some pieces of equipment are. When it comes to items that have the most amount of stats, we have the helmet, chest, legs, which come in second behind the necklaces and rings. And outside of the five power items which have the most stats, second place is the shoulders, gloves, belts, and boots. These four items have 25% less stats on them total than the previous ones. And then we have the capes and bracers, which have the least amount of stats out of everything, having almost 45% less stats than the helmet, chest, and legs. And then when it comes to weapons, a main hand plus offhand combo has about the same amount of stats as a two-handed weapon, which has about three times as much stats as a helmet, chest, or leg. Definitely making your two-handed weapon the highest stat stick you can obtain which is why getting a better weapon is usually a huge upgrade, and why they tried to limit Fury Warriors so much because they can use two of them. So if you're crafting specific pieces of gear to fit a specific slot, like say a Shadowlands Legendary, and want to get the biggest upgrade of stats, just remember the helmet, chest, and legs technically have the most amount of stats. The rings and necklaces are just about the same, but are heavily inflated in secondary stats, then you have the shoulders, gloves, belts, and boots, which are 25% below the previous five. And at the very bottom, you have capes and bracers, which is 45% below the higher slots, making them the lowest amount of upgrades you can get, where you would need five bracers to match the stats of a two-handed weapon. And just a side note, seeing how random this information is, you can definitely see why it belongs in a video like the unknown side of WoW, and would probably never come up in a more conventional video. I'm sure most people know that a lot of spells and buffs used to have reagents attached to them, where you need specific items in your bag in order to use them. Usually, they were only required for buffs that affected a large amount of people, like a Gift of the Wild, for example, which used to give everyone in your raid the Mark of the Wild buff. And usually, only the mass AoE buffs required a reagent, as I guess it was a way to make it so that you would actually prefer to use some of the normal target single buffs on yourself, and not just use the AoE buff for everything. And nowadays, if a class does have any kind of buff they can give another player, it's automatically an AoE buff when they use it. However, for a very short time in Vanilla WoW, Blizzard tried adding reagents to a lot of single target major buffs in the game, more specifically the final ranks of Mark of the Wild, Arcane Intellect, and Power Word Fortitude. In patch 1.1, Blizzard added reagent requirements to these three spells, as lots of spells of Vanilla WoW had reagents, so it kind of made sense. Although immediately in the very next minor patch, in patch 1.1.1, they removed the reagent requirements from these three spells because people were used to being able to use them whenever they wanted and didn't like having to spend a whole bunch of reagents on the single target versions of their spells. And this is something that a lot of people probably don't even know about, since this was only in the game for a very short while. And the 2019 Classic WoW never had any reagents on their max level versions of spells, since it was kind of a bad idea that was reversed pretty quickly. In Vanilla WoW, there's a secret quest chain that you can acquire randomly by collecting various messages and bottles along the shore of Stranglethorn. Normally, these lost messages might have random junk inside of them. Sometimes they have letters detailing the captivity of a princess stuck on an island. And one of those will give you a quest called Message in a Bottle. When you finally obtain the quest, you get a message which reads, The note reads in fairly good handwriting. To any that can aid me, please, my need for help is dire. A great sky main holds me captive on an island in the South Seas. The stars at night are foreign to me and obscured by the jungle trees. But on the clearest days, I see wild shore to the northwest, and what seem to be large sailing ships to the southwest. I beg of you, my would-be savior, please help me. If you swim over to Jaguro Isle, you'll eventually be able to find the person who wrote the note, who is a female torn princess. who will tell you that she has been imprisoned by the great sky main King Mukla, and that he commands all of the beasts of the island. And then if you are to free her, you need to defeat King Mukla and get the key to her chains. However, King Mukla was a level 51 elite, whereas the quest itself only requires level 45 to accept it. So you definitely needed to group up in order to defeat the giant ape, because of both the 6th level difference and the elite status. Once you manage to defeat King Mukla, you'll be awarded with a ring that has a whole bunch of stamina on it, and she'll thank you for freeing her. This short quest chain isn't really necessary to complete if you're questing through the zone, and in fact, I'm sure a lot of classic WoW guides will tell you to avoid the quest line because it's so difficult. So, I'm sure there's many people who've never actually completed it. In Cataclysm, when they updated the zone, they actually kept the quest chain in, and just extended it by adding a couple of other side quests to the main one, 
where you go and defeat some of the creatures on the island, as well as get back some of the princess's items. Paired with the fact that King Bukla is no longer a much higher level creature, as early WoW used to like to balance the hard NPCs by just making them a higher level than everything else. With the update, it's now an appropriate level as everything else, and no longer an elite. So, much easier to kill by yourself. Also, one last thing. This quest chain is most likely a reference to King Kong, since it's a giant gorilla who has a captive princess. During the Sanctum of Domination main questline for Shadowlands, you have a quest which will send you into Torghast in order to collect Uther's soul. However, when you go into the room which houses Uther's soul fragment, there are a whole bunch of other soul fragments right next to it that don't have any specific names on them, but instead have almost poetic nicknames. And based on the lore of where you're at, it's possible to guess exactly who each of these soul fragments belonged to when they were stolen by the Frostmourne. So, with the context of it being things that Arthas probably killed himself, and all of them being major lore characters, it's not that hard to figure them out, as players did immediately after this quest went live. The Arch Magus Mentor is most likely a reference to Antonidas, who was the leader of Dalaran and killed by Arthas when he sacked the city in order to get the Book of Bendive needed to summon Archimon. The Betrayed Father is obviously Arthas' father, Terranus Minethel II, who he succeeded in a very famous cinematic in Warcraft 3. The Blood Queen is obviously Blood Queen Lanethel, who was one of the bosses in ICC, and was killed by Arthas during his Northrend excursion when he was fighting against Illidan's forces, including Kel'Thuzad's Blood Elves, then transforming them into the vampire-like Sandlion we see within the raid. The Champion of Peace is most likely the character Gavinrad, who was one of the original first five paladins created during the Second War and was the one who gave Arthas his hammer known as the Lights of Vengeance, and was then killed by Arthas when he was defending the buried remains of Kel'Thuzad. The first paladin is obviously Uther the Lightbringer, the main reason you're on this quest. The Golden King is Anastarian Sunstrider, who was Kel'Thas' dad and was killed by Arthas personally after he dared wounded Invincible while the undead sacked Silvermoon. The Grand Magister is another blood elf, this time below Vir Solinar. Belover was the Grand Magister prior to Romoth, and took charge of defending Silvermoon after Sylvanas was killed, who was then slain by Arthas shortly after teleporting Lady Leodrin to safety. The Guardian of Naxxramas is Sapphirion, who was the dragon boss of Naxxramas, and in life was an ancient blue dragon, who was one of the oldest of the blue dragon flight alongside Malagos. He was killed by Arthas and Anubarak when they wanted his magical artifacts and raided his lair. And finally, there's the Holy Lifebringer, which most likely belongs to Halak who was a human paladin that led the Circle of Holy Light, a resistance force that tried to cleanse the ruins of Lord Aran of Undead and reclaim the city until he was killed by Arthas and Sylvanas, and then his soul tortured eternally within the blade until his will broke, and he cursed the light, abandoning it. He is also seen again in a questline for the Frost Death Knight who, alongside his brothers and sisters of the Circle Hand, try in their cursed undeath to stop you from reforging Frostmourne. So there are a lot of pretty important people housed here, and it's just kind of a backdropping to a quest that many people probably didn't even notice. You don't even actually need to interact with any of them, which makes it a really nice lore easter egg to people who were probably able to guess all of them. As personally, I could only guess about 75% of them when I first did the quest, so kudos to the people who figured out the rest of them later.